Hi everyone, oh, welcome back to the Econ Playground. Uh, today I wanted to try something a little different. I wanted to um, present to you some stuff I've been thinking about. I've been reading um, Abner Greif's 2006 book and uh, a, he uses a lot of uh, terms that other people don't use or he uses a lot of terms that other people use, but he uses them in a totally different way. So as a kind of exercise to try to um, explain some of the key concepts in the book, I wanted to present a sort of glossary of Abner Greif and of his, um, his, his way of looking at institutional economics. So first off, who is Abner Greif? He's a, a prominent um, economic historian and um, institutional theorist. A lot of his work he did throughout the, the 90s and, and, and 2000s. Um, uh, and he's kind of following in the tradition of someone like Douglas North, who's done, who is trying to take the traditional things that economics looks at and expand the toolbox. So you can look at um, history and you can look at the state and you can look at other institutions, not just uh, interactions between people on the market. But once you start doing that, um, economics seems to like break down. So you can't just say oh, that somebody has a budget constraint and then they maximize with respect to their budget constraint. You have to talk about all of these other kinds of things. What are the laws? What are the rules? Um, how does a feudal system look different than a market system? And so um, Doug North has developed, um, well, and a lot of other theorists around him, someone like Mansur Olson or someone like um, Eleanor Ostrom have also developed um, you know, ways of looking at institutions but uh, Abner Greif has a quite um, unique approach that has really attracted me. So I'm going to focus on his concept. So whenever I use a word, I'm using the Greifian definition, not the Northian or the Ostromian or anything like that. And one of the key um, questions historically that Abner Greif was interested in was trade in uh, the medieval era. So trade between um, Italy across the Mediterranean, um, in Northern Europe, across Europe, um, between Europe and the um, the, the, the Muslim world. And the question of trade always uh, over long distances, especially between states, you're not going to be able to talk about um, institutions just uh, very easily. You can't just talk about, okay, what were the rules for trade? Uh, as if there's somebody that, that stands on top of all of Europe, just enforcing all of the international trade in Europe. So the, the whatever norms that they developed, however trade worked, whatever rules that they had they had to be enforced on their own sake but like by the by the sake of the rule so he calls this endogenous enforcement and when you have to talk start talking about endogenous enforcement then you can't just talk about rules as if they're these things that fall out of the sky and just uh operate on their own so what this book does is it both goes into historically some stuff about um traders and um the, the Maghribi traders or the, the Hanseatic League and these famous um, successful uh, tra trade associations and, and guilds in medieval Europe, but also it uses those as just examples to talk about another way of talking about institutions. So um, that, that, that focuses on, on endogenous enforcement. So um, I'm not gonna really, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, history, but, but um, not any of the history in the book. I'm mostly just gonna be talking about the, the theoretical uh, parts of the book. So one of the things that, um, well, the, Greif builds a bunch of, of theoretical stuff, but when, he, when it comes down to actually modding, modeling a particular scenario, he wants us to use um, game theory. He thinks that's the most relevant um, formal mathematical way of modeling the way that he's talking about institutions. So what we have here is the classic coordination game, or um, it's probably gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about it mostly as the road game, right? So we've got two players, uh, blue, and, blue and red, or um, one and two, right? And they both can make the move left or right. So this is supposed to be, um, you're driving on the road, you can either drive on the left side of the road or the right side of the road. And the blue player is going north and the red player is going south. So on, on the same road that is, right? So um, if both of them drive on the left side of the road, egocentrically, he says, with, meaning like with respect to yourself, then they're gonna pass by each other and they can both get to their destination. They get one point or something like that. They get a payoff of one. But um, they can get the same thing if they both drive on the right-hand side of the road, right? Uh, if they both drive on the right, they can pass by each other, no problem. And they both get one point, they get to their destination, fine. But if they both decide, if one of them decides to drive on the left and one of them decides to drive on the right, um, then they'll crash, they don't get to their destination and there's a, a horrific uh, event ensues. And the, but the same thing happens if uh, blue picks, um, 
left and red picks right. You get the same event. So um, there's nothing intrinsically better here about left or right. But what does matter is that um, you pick the same one as the other person so that you guys are, are coordinating together somehow. So formally speaking, I'm not going to get too much into the game theory. I'm kind of going to assume that you guys know some game theory, that these are both Nash equilibria, right? So these are both uh, sets of best responses to each other. So left is the best response to left and uh, left is the best response to left and right is the best response to right, right is the best response to right. But so what makes the the game theory super interesting is it's not just like, oh, well, I have my um, set of things that I can do and then I maximize with respect to it. So you can just go, oh, well, I can do left or right. So given that they're doing left, I'll play left as well. If you know that they're playing left, you can, the problem is that simple. But the what what the theory does is it really brings forward the fact that what people believe and what they expect is always relevant. It's And it's it's like, baked into the question. So when you're doing like a normal mathematical maximization question with respect to some constraints, that there there are beliefs and expectations going on, but usually you, you keep, they, they're, they're pushed in the background. But what game theory does is it brings some, them to the foreground so that you can't forget about them. And especially something like the coordination game, like Prisoner's Dilemma is has a strictly dominated outcome. So it, you're always going to pick something. It doesn't matter what the other player is going to do. You're always going to pick a uh, defect in a, in a one-shot game. But with a coordination game, it like where we we need to start talking about beliefs, and so that's what um, Greif thinks is really important with institutions. So the way that he defines institutions is as it's very interesting. It's it's a strange move as a system of social factors that conjointly generate a regularity of behavior. Okay, so what does that mean? That sounds like it can mean absolutely anything. So in the context of the the road game, it's left left and right right count as stable institutions because um they're a set of behavior that if you're playing if you're both playing it you'd keep playing it over and over again so if you can think of this as a repeated game that the playing left right is never really part of an equilibrium you one side would always find a profitable deviation right assuming that the other side is playing a fixed strategy you would always find a profitable deviation from one side so basically he's defining um the, the 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 institution itself not as any any particular rule like the government puts a rule down or something like that but the fact that this is a set of behaviors that we can do over and over again um is what he defines as an institution so or he'll also define it as a system of rules beliefs norms and organizations that together generate a regularity of social behavior which is a little bit is it's a little bit more expanded in what kinds of things you're talking about you're not just talking about um the the you're not just defining it by the regularity of behavior but um well i suppose it is it's the system of social factors thing but but this is getting a little bit more specific about what the, this the institution is a whole group of things so it's the set of things that inspires you to play the same um, set of strategies over and over and over again. So in this case, that being both playing left or both playing right, right? So th this, is, this is what he defines as an institution, as what you're regularly playing, or sometimes it's called the institutions as equilibria approach. Not necessarily meaning Nash equilibria only, but just um, equilibria in general. And so then he brings up another word, which he calls the institutional elements, okay? And institutional elements are basically the, what a lot of other people just normally call institutions. So he, they're the rules, beliefs, norms, and organizations that together motivate, enable, and guide individuals to follow one behavior among the many that are technologically feasible in social situations. So thinking back to the road, both driving on the left and right are technologically feasible, right? But what, the what the, the if if he gives an example of um mickey mouse right so if mickey mouse comes up to you guys and and it has a sign on the side of the road that says everyone should drive on the left right everyone should always drive on the left side of the road then um does that mean that you would all of a sudden believe that the other person also expects to drive on the left side of the road what if there's another sign that's from the department of transportation that says um oh everyone should drive on the right hand side of the road well now there's those signs on the side of the road are basically a set of things that 
that you have to think about that the other person has to think about and you start to think okay well given that we both know everybody knows this information that these signs are here what side of the road am i going to drive on well the intuition or the understanding is that since we think that the since both of us are in the united states and we both think that the united states federal government has authority because of the constitution and et cetera, et cetera that we both trust the federal government and that, that the Department of Transportation is the legitimate authority on the matter of roads. <coughs> Maybe Mickey Mouse is the legitimate authority when it comes to Disneyland, so if we're in Disneyland, and we have that sign that's where it's Mickey Mouse saying everyone should drive on the left, and then Department of Transportation says everyone should drive on the right, we might actually follow Mickey Mouse. That's a different question. But basically, the, the point is to say that what, when you bring beliefs into the foreground, because what you expect other people to do and what um, you expect is right to do or what you think other people want to do is very relevant. All these extra things that have to do with learning, how do people learn, how do people generate their beliefs and expectations about the world, they become hyper relevant, right? So another example would be like a traffic light. It would be a slightly different game. You, it would be like a go stop game where if we both go at the same time, we crash. But um, if you go first and I go second, slightly, it's slightly not as good for me, but, um, or well, well, that, yeah, because I'm, I'm a little bit later, but, but, you know, at least we don't crash. So I think like a stop go game or a first second game would be kind of like the battle of the sexes game. But in the real world, the way that we solve that is with the traffic light. We know red means stop, go, green means go. Kids learn this at like a very young age. It's a, it's one of the coolest things because like when you're a little kid, you like start to learn the, the, the rules of the world and stuff like that. And like traffic lights are literally color coded for you. You know, there's not even any reading involved. So even even someone who, who, do, who doesn't speak English, who doesn't know anything about the history of the United States can understand traffic lights. So it's traffic lights are quite a good um, institutional element. But but the, these elements can be like much, much broader things too. So like the constitution of the United States is it's, it's, it's got a list of what the government can do. It's got a list of what rights we have and stuff like that. And so you can talk about, um, you know, the, the, how the divine nature of our rights and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and all of that background philosophy is involved in this too. It's about what do I expect the government to do and what do I expect other people to expect the government to do, right? So like we have freedom of speech in America through the Bill of Rights, but it's not just because the Bill of Rights is there with, with it written on it that we expect our, our speech to be upheld, right? <coughs> the, uh, like the Soviet Union has, has freedom of had freedom of speech in their constitution. It doesn't mean that people actually expected it to be upheld or that anyone expected the government to do it or that the government expect, thought that that was expected of them so that they could, they could shirk on that all the time. And you could talk about Britain too. Britain has freedom of speech, but but it's not written down in a um, bill of rights precisely the same way that the American constitution has it. So, I mean, people relatively expect freedom of speech there, but it's not it's not guaranteed in the same way as it is in America. It doesn't mean it's not even guaranteed. It's just not guaranteed in the same way. But another institutional element could be somebody like the Pope, right? So Catholic Christians think that the Pope is, is the authority sitting in the seat of St. Peter and, and such. And so when they say, what do I expect other people in the church to do? Um, one of the people that we revolve around is the Pope, right? But maybe someone, maybe the, 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 the papacy itself, someone might distrust. Someone might say, oh, well, this Pope is not a good Pope. He's, he's uh, a heretic and such. So I don't, I'm not going to trust him. So the, if, if the Pope is a heretic, it's less likely that people will um, coordinate around them in a way. So the, all of that, all of that goes in, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later when I, I bring up um, organizations. But so a lot of them, the, 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 the first definition here, institution, is quite broad, right? But you see that you have to make it broad because of how complex every, every single one of these situations is. The, the traffic lights are relatively simple, but once you start to realize that something like something as deep and, and complicated um, as the, the, the Constitution of the United States or the, or the Pope, is kind of like one of these factors and institutional elements, then it, it gets, um, you, you realize that a, a very broad definition is probably going to be the most useful one at the time, right? As, so far, right? So then he, he, he gives an example of um, 
just this is almost for for technical definitions the difference between a central and an auxiliary transaction so um a central transaction let's say we're talking about the institution of um people trading and and go, getting into contracts with one another right so if if we uh, meet up and we're going to do some kind of contract with one another and i say i'm going to give you this for this amount of dollars and then you say i'm going to give you this amount of dollars for whatever you're selling me and then we shake hands on it well we both expect each other to actually go through with the deal well why do we expect that so with respect to the institution of trade since that's the primary example uh, we, 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 we would call that the central transaction, the handshake or the contract or, or, or whatever we want to call it. But why do I expect you, if you're a total stranger, to actually do that for me? Maybe it's because I think that you're a trustworthy person or a good person or something like that. But just for absolutely anyone, you're not going to expect everyone's a good person. So um, something like the court system, right? I know we both I know that the court system exists. You know that the court system exists. And we both know that if if you um you know shirk on the deal and we have this written contract and someone saw us shaking hands and talking about it or something like that, that I can bring you to court and that that you're gonna uh, get prosecuted for it and I'm I'm gonna get my money. So the the auxiliary transaction is not is isn't what we're worried about right now. So if we're worried about why is there a regularity of behavior of when people shake hands and write contracts with each other, they actually do what's on the contract, right? And it's because we both believe that we'll be punished otherwise um, if, if, we, if we shirk on the contract. And that's what the auxiliary transaction, basically the auxiliary transaction is in some oftentimes another institution that supports the institutional elements that, su that support the central transaction. So it's not like there's a set of transactions that are central and a set that are auxiliary. But when you're discussing a particular institution, a particular regularity of behavior, you want to refer to a few central transactions and then all the other ones that support it are called auxiliary. So it's kind of, it's, this definition is about what you're focusing on um, at the time for any given institution. But um, organizations is another word that people use in the institutional economics literature. And so the way that, that Greif wants to talk about it is as a, um, both as an institution, uh, both as an institutional element. So like the court system is something that supports um, our trade and our contracts. And the Catholic church supports the, the um, maybe the, in the medieval era, the legitimacy of the king or something like that. If the Pope says this guy is good, then everyone expects everyone to think that this guy is good. But organizations also themselves are um, are institutions as well, right? So um, so also everyone within the institution needs to know how we operate here and uh, has to expect everyone else to act the same way and for all of us to to be able to cooperate like that. There has to the institution the, the organization itself is is a, is a self enforcing um, system that's that's kind of more than the sum of its parts because of the expectations that people have about each other. But it also is a institutional element into other systems. So I give an example of school here. The, the, the school has to operate the same way. Everyone has to know uh, who the principal is, that they're going to respect it, who the teachers are, what teachers get to say to students, um, what teachers are expected to do, what they're expected to teach, um, the way that students are supposed to behave, what, what say parents get to have, if it's a public school, private school, what the difference between those things are. But then also it's an institutional element in that it's creating or it's it's um, indoctrinating or, or generating um, a bunch of rules for people. So everything that I was saying about the Pope and the Constitution and traffic lights, traffic lights you learn in like kindergarten, but the Pope and the Constitution, you learn that, I don't know, in high school or middle school or, or college or whatever. But all of those things you start to learn and, and you generate the relevant um, uh, institutional elements. So, so school supports all of these other things, right? So if you go into the the like boot camp would be another organization where everybody goes in and everyone knows who the, who the sergeant is and everyone knows that they've got to respect the sergeant and that's kind of self-enforcing. But at the same time, um, boot camp is also generating the expectations about how you're going to interact out in the field and when you actually have a re are in a real uh, battle situation, what you're going to have to do. Right. So one of the cool things about the way that Greif talks about institutions is that it's it's uh, very uh, conducive to talking about 
endogenous change, which is kind of a hard problem in, in institutional theory. So one, one uh, he gives a, a few different um, ways of thinking about it here. The first he calls a quasi parameter. So going back to the, the, the game, the parameters of a game, right, are, um, are, are, are like the, uh, the payoffs and like the hard things <clears throat> that are said about the game, like, um, and also maybe like your discount rate in a, in a repeated game, like your, your level of, um, of impatience or, or something like that, or time preference, we call it. So, um, but so sometimes the, the way that an institution works, the way that you play over time will change the parameter. So at, for any given game, for any given stage, we know what the parameter is, right? We know what the parameters are and we act with respect to them. So that can make an institution um, self-enforcing. But if the game changes the set of parameters, so he gives an example of a um, prisoner's dilemma game where over time, um, over time, like every, let's say we, we can generate the, um, uh, in a repeated prisoner's dilemma, we can do the cooperate, cooperate over a number of periods. Then let's say that when that happens, every time that we cooperate, you add like a, a, a tiny positive um, element to the cooperate, cooperate payoffs. And then that means that the more times that you play, the, the larger range of um, discount rates will be able to support a um, cooperate, cooperate equilibrium. And the same thing um, occurs for um, what he calls a, a, a self undermining equilibrium. So that's a self reinforcing equilibrium where the quasi parameters shift over time and make the set of potential equilibriums expand, right? Self undermining equilibrium would be if there's like a positive sum added to the wings to the cheating payoff. And so over time, it, 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 the, the set of equilibrium shrinks. So you can think of um, um, institutions that self-destruct. So if you have like a school where um, the, the way that the equilibrium of the school is set up, teachers are expected to teach students that the principal is a bad guy or something like that. And that all um, principals for all history have been um, cheaters and liars. Then as the school continues to operate at that equilibrium of teach people to have a revolution, um, eventually those parameters are going to explode the expectation that we should respect the principle and that everyone else wants to respect the principle so that that, that, that institution is more likely to explode. That's like a self-undermining school. But a self-reinforcing school would be one where at the beginning of every class, everyone says like a prayer to the principal, like we love the principal and he's a, a great guy and they worship him or something like that. And so the, then the longer that the school goes on, get, like ceteris paribus, given that, that these kids like don't have access to a library or whatever, where they know that principals really are cheaters or whatever, then, um, then over time, the school will get stronger and stronger. And then you'll have this contingent of super students who will die for their principal. Um, so, but you can, you can see how this can apply to, to many, many uh, different situations and gets very interesting. But uh, another thing that he, he talks about is what, what he calls the uh, institutional asymmetry, right? So um, if there is a change uh, somehow, maybe it's related to one of these other self um, reinforcing or undermining institutions that explodes or gets stronger or something like that. So if there's some kind of change in um, what you can possibly do, um, then there, there might be new potential self enforcing equilibria, but the institutional elements from the previous period that supported our old equilibria um, don't let you move there, right? So if you move into a new environment, you're bringing with you um, your beliefs and norms and all of these other institutions that came um, with you from the past, right? So he talks about um, the, um, the, so just the asymmetry just means that um, elements, like the institutional elements and the set of equilibria aren't generated by the same process, right? So I think you can think of that in terms of um, Darwinian evolution, where the environment that you're in, wh whatever is going to be um, saying what 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 sets of um, organisms and uh, things are would be like a set of organisms that um, create a stable ecosystem is not the same process that generates which one of those equilibrium is going to be selected. So um, the process of mutation and random variation and independent variation. What is it independent of? It's independent of the environment. So basically institutional asymmetry is is talking about independent variation 
in beliefs um, relative to the possible sets of institutions. So an important thing is he talks about the coordination effects of the asymmetry is basically that the, um, the institutional elements are one of the things that we inherit from the past or that we generate new um, can affect the selection among uh, multiple potential institutions. And then he talks about also the inclusive effects of asymmetry. There's a cost and there's a coordination to telling people, hey, there's a new possibility. It, even if someone realizes there's some kind of new possibility, there's a cost to um, going out there and trying to change people's minds like about the, like, like for example, if, if we remember that um, the Catholic Church is an organization, uh, that both internally and they count as an institutional element into other things uh, at a certain point, Luther was like, hey, we could have something else or we could do, well, that's not exactly how Luther operated, but a lot of people in the, in the Protestant Reformation were like, hey, we could do something else, but that takes effort to convince people that there's someone other than the, the Pope that they can respect as the, as the authority on religious matters and, and wider matters, right? So that there's a bias towards having old institutions because there's a cost to it, but that doesn't mean that um, institutions from the uh, institutional elements from the past dominate. You're not dictated by the past, but there is always an influence from the past, right? So, um, and he also talks about how certain institutions or sets of institutions can complement each other. And, and you can see, so like certain sets of institutions might be self-reinforcing to one another or self-undermining to, to, to each other. So like the example I gave of the um, library, if there's a school that's trying to um, indoctrinate all the students that the principal is the greatest guy in the world and that they should always follow him and that over time that's going to make the school stronger and stronger if there's another institution called like the internet where they all have access to the internet they can look stuff up and go like oh that's actually uh totally ridiculous and then the the institution will fall apart so you might have heard this famous quote from from george orwell in 1984 whoever controls the past controls the future and whoever controls the present controls the past. So controlling the past would, in, in terms of Grife would mean something like controlling which institutional elements are inherited from the past into the present, right? And such that generate our expectations for how we're gonna to coordinate tomorrow. Whereas um, whoever controls the present controls the past. So whoever is, has power today gets to sometimes to, to a certain degree, certain degree 1984 is the extreme example of this but being able to select what people remember and what people don't remember and all of this stuff that we inherit from the past is helping us in ways that sometimes we don't know and sometimes it's hurting us in ways that we don't know so paying attention to history and things like that is is very important for um coordination and, and understanding and and not having whoever controls the present absolutely control the future right so going back to the the road game again, there's actually a great example, I think, of um, how institutional asymmetry plays out with um, the road, right? With how, how, how things work on the road and how the technical possibilities of, of being on the road change over time. So in different countries around the world, different people drive on the left and different people drive on the right. So in this map, we've got um, all of these red states here are countries that drive on the right, and all of the blue states are, are countries that drive on the left. I, I believe this is present day. So the question is, why, right? Why do some drive on the right? Why do some drive on the left? You, you'd feel like um, just, you know, at the dawn of mankind or whatever, the coordination point would be the right because um, they, um, that, that you know, like, you know, our dominant hand is right or something like that. Or I've heard stories about things like, Oh, well, when a, a horse and buggy rider was going to whip their horse to make it go faster, they use their right hand. So they have to sit on the left side of the cart so that their, their, their whip is in the center. And then that means that it's best for them, for the, um, for the buggies to drive on the right side of the road so that they don't run into the, the people on the other side, right? And um, so th these are some possibilities, but nevertheless, many countries still drive on the left, right? And so I, I'm not sure exactly why this happens or why, why Britain started on the left, but the famous story that everyone knows is most countries that are British colonies or, or a lot of countries that were formerly British colonies are today um, countries that drive on the left. So some big ones like India, um, Australia, um, 
Um, and some, some of these, Afri I'm not sure exactly which of the African countries were British colonies and oh, well, New Zealand, of course, I think maybe South Africa, I think South Africa, actually, definitely. Um, and Pakistan, of course, and then, of course, uh, England here and Ireland, right? Ireland is now independent, but it was at one point, point part of the United Kingdom not too long ago. So the, the question is, it, they're inheriting these things from the past, right? Um, they're inheriting um, the, the expectations that you drive on the left from the time that they're colonized, even after they, they, they change. So if we think of it as a totally exogenous, you know, what the British tell us to do, we've got to do, or the British established the left sign. And so everyone follows the, we drive on the left thing. And then the British one day say, oh, we're going to leave. You know, in India, they're still driving on the left, right? I suppose it's technically possible for them to switch. Maybe if they, if they, um, if Pakistan wanted to, um, I think this is Afghanistan. If, 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 if Afghanistan and Pakistan have a border with each other that they want people to drive back and forth, um, I suppose it would be convenient for Pakistan to switch to the, the right-hand side, but, but uh, they don't have to, right? And then think, look at somewhere like South Africa. South Africa has no reason to switch to the right if they want to coordinate with their neighbors, right? Because the, there's a border, all of their border, everyone can just leave on, and go on the left. But these countries might feel more pressure to switch to the right. So different countries have actually um, the different coordination thing. Now I'm sure at the border they have some kind of system for managing this. But um, another thing that I've thought about and noticed is that a lot of these nations that are still driving on the left are islands, right? So there's a number of British colonies that have switched to the right, um, like uh, Kenya and um, uh, a couple others um, that I that I can't think of right now. But but um, but many of the the countries that haven't switched to the right hand side of the road are islands like Australia or New Zealand or all of these, I, I, a number of these islands were British colonies and many of these, uh, the Caribbean islands were British colonies, right? And, um, and England is, itself, of course, is an island. So they have no need to coordinate with the rest of Europe. They can just sit on their merry way and, and keep driving on the left, right? So um, that, that's what I was investigating. And if you, and if you look here on this map, this is a map that says, okay, if it's if it's this dark red, they drive on the right. If it's dark blue, they drive on the left. And if it's this uh, bright red, they switch from left to right. So all of these countries, they they switch to coordinate with the countries that are near um, closer to them, right? And um, the blue ones still drive on the on the left. And now it looks like some of them, it's very rare, but this nation, I'm not sure what, what nation this is, but this nation, they switched from the right to the left, right? Because they wanted to coordinate with their neighbors. And, um, but, but um, m most of these dark blue countries, these islands are dark blue, blue countries. They have no need to switch. Japan was never a British colony, but they have no need to coordinate with um, South Korea because, you know, they're, they're, they don't have a land border. So it's not, they're not going to have this problem at the border. Um, and um, Pakistan might feel pressure and places like Bangladesh might feel, feel pressure, but India feels no pressure and Sri Lanka, of course, feels no pressure, right? So um, that, that's, that's an interesting thing. So I just ran some quick um, numbers on it. I'm pretty sure this is actually the wrong test to do, but you could look at the summary statistics. I just got this off, off of Wikipedia. And um, the, the, this, will be, so this is basically the outcome variable is whether or not they drive on the left-hand side of the road, right? And so just testing it, uh, regressing it against whether or not they were a British colony, it's very, very significant. Yeah, British, if you're a British colony, it's much more likely that you're going to drive in the left-hand side of the road. Same thing if you're an island. If you're an island independent, if you're a British colony, you're much more likely to drive in the left-hand side of the road. There's, there's, if, if we, if, even if we assumed that all the countries, it was random, which one they, they, which side of the road they drive on, uh, all of the, the, the contiguous countries probably in the long run would end up coordinating around either right hand side or left hand side and it seems like it's mostly been the, the right hand side for for various reasons but islands have no need to coordinate on on the same way so it's more likely that islands kind of stick it out for longer right um so the the, the couple times actually on wikipedia that i saw that an island switched from the the left hand side to the right hand side or right hand side to left hand side is if they had a very important trade partner. So some, some Polynesian islands switched to the left-hand side of the road 
because that from the right hand side of the road, they weren't even a British colony or anything like that. They switched to the left hand side of the road because they wanted to import cars from Australia that were designed for driving on the left hand side of the road. So there's other potential reasons here that aren't necessarily border things that you might want to, you're coordinating not around what side of the ride road are you driving on because these people are your neighbors, but because you want to trade um, in a particular type of good that, that's, that's worthwhile. And then if, if you regress um, both of them together, they, they both remain significant. So that's, I think, just one um, simple example of expanding on, on Greif and the institutional asymmetry stuff, but the, the issues that he gets into in the book are, are, are much more um, complicated and, and of, of more... Um, momentous import historically. But I think that there's all kinds of uh, fascinating um, things. And once you start to hear these words, the, you know, what, what's an institution and what are the things that support it? And then what would that, that fact of institutional asymmetry and that that's the problem that we're wrestling with all the time in institutional change. I think that um, you start to see all kinds of um, new opportunities or new um, research ideas and stuff like that. So, um, Thanks for listening and uh, I will see you later.